eatradio.com. Everybody and welcome to the 505 on Racing Show. This is Joe Larson, and we'll be talking to you about some racing stuff that went on this weekend. The sweltering heat here on Long Island and plaguing the, the, the north eastern part of the United States, it's, it's just insane. Driving out tonight, uh, thunder and lightning, lightning bolts hitting the highway. It was, it was bad. It was really bad. But uh, I hope there's going to be a break in the heat, but it doesn't look like that. So it doesn't look like that. And speaking of the heat, Evergreen Speedway in St. John, PA, canceled their July 24th event Saturday due to the expected high heat index. And not only for their drivers who are in these cars and are normally hot anyway, but for their fans as well to sit there for three, four, five, even six hours to watch an event. They just didn't feel it was good, good, good business to do that. And they actually f feared their fans and, and drivers passing out and getting sunstroke. So they canceled their event. And I'll tell you what, I've never... In, in, in my entire life of racing, 40 plus years of doing this, heard of a racetrack canceling due to heat. But at the same time, NASCAR CEO Brian France had said he has some concerns about the heat as well and had talked about uh, changing or altering or even canceling uh, the event at Pocono next weekend. And after seeing Indy and the heat, the sweltering heat that was in Indianapolis at the Brickyard, and in the empty, and when I say empty, the place was empty. And part of that, I, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to roll the dice here. Part of that, I have to think, had to do with the heat. Um, when, you, when you think about sitting out there in the sun and being baked, it, it's just, it's not healthy, number one. And number two, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth to get sunstroke or, or burnt to a crisp uh, to watch an event? And no. And, and even though the seats were empty, a lot of people got to understand that those seats, a majority of them, were paid for a year ago. So they still got the revenue. You know, the, the Brickyard still got the revenue for that event. It's just that a lot of people stayed home. A lot of people watched it from the, the, the air-conditioned hotel rooms. They were not going to deal with the heat. So heat being a factor um, at these racetracks. And, and it's usually it happens in mid-August, but you know our weather patterns up here in the Northeast are just not what they used to be. And uh, when you have a 110 degree heat index, it's, that's not good. And you could drink all the water you want. Um, you need to get electrolytes in here as well. And, and the water sometimes just gets absorbed and it flushes through. You gotta replace your electrolytes. And I'm sounding like I'm, I'm an expert in the medical field, but <laughs> from experience, <laughs> <laughs> from experience, and, and in fact, I can remember I worked in a race in New Hampshire Motor Speedway a few years back, and it was, it was hot, it was in the 90s, and I was cold. I was actually cold. I actually put on a, one of my NASCAR pullovers, and everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy, and, and, I, and I couldn't wait to get my fire suit on and go on pit road because I was going to be warm, I thought. But even with the pull, I was still cold, so somebody suggested I go to the Interfield Care Center, which I did. And when I went in there, they took one look at me, they did a couple of things, and they said, you're dehydrated. And they, they gave me a couple of you know, bottles of uh, fluid. So, um, you know, don't, don't let that kid you out. And, and the day to get hydrated for an event in the heat is not that morning. It's, you need to hydrate a couple of days before. So this heat's not going away anytime soon up here in the Northeast. So if you're out there racing or even watching races, make sure you hydrate yourself and get those electric lights in you. But, uh, you know, for, for racetrack, such as Evergreen, who missing a week could really hurt them to call and pull the plug because of heat. I'll tell you what, my hat's off to, to Dino and the guys over at, not Dino, but the other guys over at Evergreen Speedway. Anyway, uh, the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour was up at Monadnock. Got rained out Saturday. They raced Sunday uh, early afternoon. And uh, Long Island's Timmy Salomino earned the pole and earned the victory as well. Uh, followed by Rowan Pennick in second, uh, Jimmy Blue at third, Eric Goodale fourth, Justin Bonson, your fifth, Doug Kobe was sixth, Max Zakam was seventh, Woody Pitcat eighth, Robbie Summers ninth, and Donnie Lee rounded out the top ten. 
when I'd knock a little short track up in, in a hole in the ground, literally, uh, there's no cell phone service. You go down this road, it's, it's, you're in a valley, and there's no breeze, and it was, you know, it gets hot there. But it was rained out Saturday, and they ran, you know, Sunday as well. So, you know, when, when, I, when I look at that, when I look at an event like that, it's here we are on a short track, similar to Long Island's Riverhead Raceway, a quarter mile bull ring, and it was, from what I understand, a decent race. I did not watch it. I did not see any highlights from it. But I understand it was a good race. And, and Timmy told me, you know, I'm you, that's, that's, man, that's his home track, that kind of a racetrack, quarter mile bull ring. And, uh, you know, Timmy got that victory there. And, and Timmy, a guest on the 505 on racing show at one time, um, I congratulate him on, on that victory in that poll. He's, uh, he's doing very well with the Flamingo Motorsports team. And, and I'll tell you what, here's a young guy that with the right, situation. I, I think he's going to move up the ranks similar to the way that Ryan Priest has moved up from the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour. Um, you know, the, the tour is starting to develop a lot of drivers who are making it, making it through the ranks. You know, some have gone up and come back. You know, uh, when you look at Todd Zegedy, after he won that championship, I believe it was in 2003 or 2004, when he went into the, what was called then the Nationwide Now Xfinity Series. And uh, the only thing that got him back into modifieds and out of that series, the number two series in NASCAR, the Xfinity slash Old Nationwide, was money, was money. It's no longer talent. Years ago, it was talent. You know, you built your own cars and, and you had a little small crew and you, you traveled to races and you showed yourself and people watched you and noticed you and gave you a ride. Now it's, you know, they don't say, well, how many wins do you have? How many, it's how much money do you have? And I think that's what hurt Todd Zegedy when he made the, the move up. And uh, even Donnie Leo when he went to the Campbell World Truck Series back in the Modifieds now. Um, not that it's cheap to run a Modified, but you know, when you're running in the top three series, you know, you're talking big budgets and a lot of money and, and, and full-time crews for the most part. So, um, But I think Timmy's going to be, uh, I think he's on that, that rail, railroad ride to the top series. I, I really do. And you know, the, the other thing, I wanted to talk about this, and, and, and I was going to wait till later on, but I'm, I'm, while I'm on this page, you know, one of the things that, that I see on social media and those who are in my little circle know that I follow social media. I post on social media. I, I, I don't put crazy stuff. I don't, you know, oh, I, I just left my house. Oh, I'm making a left turn. Some people like step by step what they're doing all day and all night. But I, I, I was reading social media and I guess late Sunday and, and one of the teams, and I'll say the team, Jamie Tomano's team, um, one of his crew members who happens to be his daughter, um, posted something about uh, a rookie driver um, who made disparaging remarks to and about Jamie Tomano, calling him all kinds of things. I'm not going to get into the he said, she said, I heard, they said, but from what I could gather, it was a total lack of respect from a rookie competitor with, and I'm going to say this, weekly short track mentality. When you're a rookie in a touring series such as the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour, you need to let your race car do your talking. And when the race is over, there's no excuses. This guy wasn't in your way. This guy didn't bump and bang you. You just put it on the trailer, you go home, you do your homework, you come back and race. Um, Craig Lutz was the driver the, who made the disparaging remarks to and about Jamie Tomano, and, and again, I'm not going to say what was said, but he made these remarks to a former champion with 605 starts in the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour, with 43 years racing experience. He races now because he enjoys it, and that's what he's been doing for 43 years. Is he going to win races? I don't know. Maybe. He wouldn't be my pick to win the race at Stafford coming up in a couple of weeks on August 5th. But you know what? He's there every week. He doesn't tear up his equipment. He rolls it on the trailer most nights after a tour race. 
He comes back as cars for steam. And the experience that that man has, he's done more races than this kid has done laps. And, and I like Greg Lutz. I, I, like, I don't have any beefs with him. I, I had a long conversation with him at Waterford last year. I watched him come up through the go-kart ranks. Uh, nice parents, respectful. And, and this is what I think happens. You know, some spotters, and I'm not saying this was the case, but you know, you get a spotter who's in your ear. It's the spotter's this job, in my opinion, is to keep your driver settled. And you can't go out there, and, t and when your driver gets passed by, in your opinion, a has-been, you can't be in his ear saying, you can't let that guy pass, you gotta You can't do that. You can't do that. On, on any given lap, who knows? The right side might be going faster than the left side, and, and you know, you're gonna go swapping back and forth. But respect, respect has to be earned and granted. And I'm thinking a guy with 605 starts over 40 and 43 years racing experience and a past champion earned that respect. Is he in his twilight years of racing? Absolutely. Absolutely. But he's still competitive. Again, not battling for wins, but he's battling for top tens. And I'll tell you what, you get a top ten every week on a NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour, you're a force to be reckoned with. Just my, my opinion. Again, I'm not going to put the kid down. There's an experience not only on the tour, but in life in general. He, he has not faced a lot of life's lessons that most of us have already had that are in our 30s, 40s, 50s, and even, in Jamie's case, 60s. And I, and I just hope that you know, there's, there's a lesson learned here. And I know um, he was brought into the trailer with the uh, driver, when the NASCAR trailer, the driver of the 46 car, um, to discuss something that went on on the racetrack, whatever. As a rookie, the only time you should be going in the NASCAR trailer is if they're gonna tell you you did a good job. If you're going in the trailer in your rookie year to be spoken to, that's not good. That is not good. And at this level, see, he, you know, he's got some good local sponsorship, no question about it. And his dad's been doing this a long time, knows how to get the good sponsors. But when you're at this level, it's not your neighborhood people that you're gonna be looking for sponsorship for. It's regional sponsorship, corporate sponsorship. And they don't want to hear the negativity. They don't want to hear that you're going in the trailer. They don't want to hear and see on Facebook, social media, or Twitter, or anywhere that you know, you're calling a former champion names that is so immature. And I, and I hope a lesson is learned from this. And, and I'm sure I'll be getting nasty emails from people, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, you, you, you got to have respect. And you know that was the one thing that I learned the hard way when I started racing that, at that bull ring at Isis Speedway. And, and I wouldn't even call what I did back then racing. I was just doing laps. And I can remember one guy, Andy Rohde, he taught me some, some serious lessons. I got real good at changing right fronts because he stuffed me in the fence every time that he got near me because I'm going to race him. I'm not letting him pass me. And, and I learned. And, and I learned to have respect for people on the racetrack. Yeah, sometimes I got into it in the pit area with some people, and that took a long time to learn as well. But you, you, you learn, you're young, you learn, and, and whatever. And, uh, and uh, you know, Jamie Tomanio, you know, um, in, in regards to Kevin Basic from Long Island Need for Speed and his project modified, and Jamie's helped him out with parts, as have so many other people who have helped Kevin out with this, this car, this uh, former Troyer car from 1982. So. Uh, I, I just hope everything works out, that, that Greg Lutz and Jamie Tomato could go for a walk. Just go for a walk, just the two of them. Have a nice little chat and, and chat and put that behind them. And just put that behind them. So uh, that's it with that. I'm going to take a break. When I come back, we're going to talk about what went on in Indy this past weekend when we come back.
What's up, guys? We're Scan Off Fair, and we're here with Enravio. If they catch you at a show with one of these bracelets, you will win a hundred bucks. That's a lot of money. So get a bracelet. Do whatever it takes to get that. Hit them up online. <laughs> Village Music Shop of Master, 1-800-HEY-DUDE, your full service store with personalized attention, school band instrument rentals and sales, music instruction on all instruments for all styles and age groups, for guitars, drums, amplifiers, PA systems and accessories, it's Village Music Shop, 1495 Montauk Highway in Master. Call 1-800-HEY-DUDE or go to villagemusicshop.com. Hey there, welcome back. Yeah, I got, got into this chat room conversation a little late. I, I don't know who we're talking about, who's what home track, or what driver, but uh, um, you know, it, it's funny today. People don't have a home track like they used to years ago. You know, uh, remember, you know some guys, Isis Speedway was the home track. You know, Thompson was their home track up in Connecticut. Stafford Motor Speedway was their home track. In some cases, Waterford is your home track. You know, it's, it's funny. When, when, when you look at the modified tour, where most of them come from, I would say about a third of the NASCAR wheel and modified tour comes out of Long Island now. Where when I first got on the tour as a part-time official in 2002 and full-time in 2003, most of the teams came out of New England. You know, um, out of Thompson, out of Stafford, Riverside Park, the old Riverside Park, a Seekonk even. Um, you know, it's it's just. You know, they ran those the SK type modifieds, which you know, turned them into a tour type modifier. It was just a little more, more horsepower and, and a little more tire. But when you, you go back, when you go back and, and people got onto the tour, you know, the little group that ran the tour back then that had all the say, they were very selective as to who they let in and who they didn't. And, and I know I've talked about this before, I can remember the, uh, the series tech director. Anybody that came from Long Island, he goes, oh, here's another one from Long Island. And, uh, you know, and, and because I was from Long Island, I couldn't tech those cars. I wasn't allowed. And, they, and, and the Jersey group would tech those, those cars. And, and, and so many times I watched them load up and go home, you know, because, you know, they weren't good enough because, you know, they, they came from Long Island. They came from a little bullring called Riverhead Raceway. And a quarter of a mile. They, how could they race for people who raced on five, eight mile racetracks and, and half mile racetracks? And, you know, well, they can't even compete. And, you know, and, and Tommy Baldwin, you know, the late Tommy Baldwin, he came in and, and broke that curse. You know, he broke that curse. But, you know, the, the man had a no nonsense attitude, Tommy Baldwin, you know, senior. And, and, he, and he rocked the boat a little bit. And he wasn't a good little wooden soldier when it came to dealing with NASCAR. And he challenged them every step of the way. And so the attitude was anybody that came out of Long Island or New York had that attitude. And then, you know, I, I know Robin Vollmuller, uh, senior, he was a, a tour guy back by way back when, driving for Joe Batuccio out of Long Island. And, and I think what Joe was doing with Robin and, and was just trying to learn the tracks for when his son, J. R. Batuccio, became eligible to drive a modified that their, their books were set, they, they did their homework with Robin Vomola. And I believe Robin Vomola did have a poll. I don't remember what track it was at, but he ran very well with them. And I think Don Howe did a couple of shows too with Joe Batuccio on the tour. Um, and I think they were at Riverhead. But you know, when, you, when you look at the influx of Long Islanders you know, that, that have come and gone, you know, you know, Greg Shivers came on into the door. He wasn't a, you know, he wasn't a, a contender, but he was there in, in racing. And, and, and Glenn Tyler, with, with limited funds and, and, and limited people and limited resources um, was up on the tour as well. 
and you know now he's he's gone on to other things and gotten more involved with his children. But you know when I look at those guys that that came and went, and they opened the door to show that hey, Long Island guys are okay. You know, Glenn Tyler was a good guy. You can have a conversation with him. He'll race you hard, but he'll race you clean. You know, and you, you look back at those guys. You know, the Shivers. The, it was a family operation. I rode the ferry with them. Anytime we had to go to New England, we'd ride up together and we'd have some good conversation. And we never let that team official thing crisscross on the ferry. You know, we did other things. We talked, and, and, and you know, his dad and his mom and, and his brother and his two sisters, you know, that was their crew for the most part, you know, coming out of Long Island. You know, then Ken Hagee came along, and then the Goodales came along with, with Kevin um, because of an incident he had with a head official there on Long Island. And he, he just threw up his hands and said, I'll run the tour. And, you know, it, it was a struggle that first year for, for them. It, it was a struggle. Here you are, you know, you were like one of the contenders at your local track. Now you're struggling to make shows. But that was in the, in the, day, um, that was in the day before, you know, everybody started. That was in the day where sometimes it was sending more cars home than not. And, and I did, I, on my figure eight car, I did have the eight ball. And I'm going to tell you a little story about that. I, I went to Mark Seifer, who was the owner of Glenn Tyler's you know, Tour Modified then. I went to Mark Seifer, and I said, Mark, uh, would, would, would you have any objection if I ran the eight ball in the figure eight car? And he goes, well, it's not my number. I, <laughs> I just look at the, the owners and what numbers they have, and it says eight ball, Mark Seifer. He goes, well, that's, that's a Tyler family number, so you'll have to get with Glenn. And so I went to Glenn, and I says, yeah, he probably wouldn't be running the A-Ball. He goes, as long as you're not running on a tour, I don't really care. So we made, made our car the A-Ball. And we, we got a lot of ribbon about the car, not only because it, it, it was unique in appearance, um, but because, and, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't even know how to say this, I don't want to offend nobody. I'm not into that, that stuff, <laughs> okay? Um, so a couple of people in the pit area made comments about, you know, the April. Oh, what are you guys dealing? What are you guys doing? We just wanted to have fun. We just wanted to have a good, good time. And, and, uh, and Gene uh, at, at ASI, uh, Gene Ullman at ASI, he was good enough to copy the eight ball just the way it was on the Tyler car. And uh, we had a good time. And, and, we, we, and Brian Cicella drove for me at that. We had a good season. He, he earned a Rookie of the Year title. It was like three rookies that year. It wasn't like, you know, there was only one. It was a bunch of rookies. And, and, and it just comes to thought, and I wish Jay Slice was on here to confirm this. You know, the last, the second to last race of the year, Brian stuffed it in the fence. I was up in a tour race. He put it in the fence so hard that not only did he bend the front clip, he bent the rear clip. Done. Finished. I'm not putting it back together for one more race. Uh, a, it was really expensive. And, and, and B, there wasn't a lot of time. I, I, was, I just didn't have the time to do it. And um, the guy that he was in contention with, and, and, and excuse me for not remembering his name, but the guy he was in contention with for Rookie of the Year honors called him up and says, what are you going to do? And he says, well, Joe said we're done. He goes, no, you're not. And, and him and his crew got together with my crew, and they got this car together, and they said, I want, I want to win or lose the, the rookie title on the racetrack not because you're not here. And we finished better than him that night, and Brian Cicella was the Rookie of the Year, and I was very proud of my driver, because the guy never drove figure eight cars before. And I can remember the first night in that car, we kind of backed into a fourth place. We, when I say backed into it, I, I said to him that night, because the gearing wasn't right. Um, I was told it was one set of gears, and we, stupid me, I didn't open it up and look. And it was, we were at the X, and it was already redlined. So I told my driver, just ride around. Just ride around. I got around, just ride around. And all of a sudden, there was a restart with like maybe four or five laps to go. And he goes, are we really, are we really fourth? It's the two of us said we're fourth. I'm going to lap down. Is it wrong? No, we're fourth. So anyway, he ends up finishing fourth. And I go to the pay-up window, and I come back. And, and, you know, and the deal was that I had with any of my drivers, they get the hardware, I get the cash. And he says to me, if you don't remember me asking, what, you know, what the car make tonight? And I said, well, Brian, because he drove my Blunderbuss car for a couple of years. I said, Brian, we made more money tonight in that one race than the Blunderbuss made all of last year. And he was like sixth in the points in the Blunderbuss at the end of the season. And uh, he goes, really? He goes, why don't more guys really figure eight cars? And uh, 
<laughs> I said, I don't know. But we made some good money with that car. That, that car was a moneymaker. And it really wasn't, you know, Need for Sweet Gary. It wasn't a Camaro. It was, it used to be a Camaro. And the plan was for that body was to make it look like a modified. That was the plan. But there was some extra bars that got in the way. And, and, and because of the height of the door, we, we couldn't get that right bend with the right gauge steel. And it kind of got squared off. So, But you know what? We, we, we had a good time with it. And, and the, the car was sold to some guy in Jersey who was restoring it to its original figure eight Camaro body, built the uh, Oh, I'm trying to remember who built it. It was built at Grumman. It was uh, built by, at, at Grumman because the guy, Grumman was shutting down. He had nothing to do, but he showed up to work every day. And um, we, the car was good. I, I got to drive it a couple of times myself. And uh, when my daughter didn't feel it, because my daughter drove that car too. And, and she had some fun with it and made money. I, I'll tell you what, I, <laughs> why guys don't drive figure eight cars? You can make a lot of money driving figure eight cars. I'm just saying. Just saying, not that I'm trying to plug the figure eight to the material like I am, but you know, if you're looking to make a couple of bucks, you know, you can end. We had a tire deal and a fuel deal, so and we we're already there. Kenny Messima, thank you. I, his, I knew it was Kenny. I couldn't remember his last name. Thank you, 28 figure eight, a uh, 22 figure eight. Thank you, and I'm glad to see your daughter is doing much better. So uh, I, I've been following that on the social media as well. So social media does have some good stuff. 22 figure eight's daughter was was under the weather, so. She's all good now, so the prayers worked. But anyway, uh, the Camp World Truck Series, they were in Eldora this past, uh, actually last Thursday night. Um, they will be going to Pocono next, uh, next weekend. And the winner there, Kyle Larson was the winner there with Christopher Bell second. We had uh, Rico Abreu was third. Jake Griffin was fourth. Tyler Reddick was fifth. Cole Custer was sixth. Cameron Haley seventh. Daniel Hemrick eighth. Austin Wayne Self, ninth, and Matt Kraft, and rounded out the top 10. The pole was won by Bobby Pierce, and he was out of the race with an accident. So the trucks were on dirt in Eldora. And I'll tell you, um, how, there should be more of that. There definitely should be more of the trucks on those shorter tracks, on the dirt. There should be more of that. And, and, I, and, and I, I don't... You know, it's, it's a good show. It's different. The fans flocked out to it. They're not flocking out to the Sprint Cup Series races anymore because it's the same. And, and you know what? You know, NASCAR needs to take a look at that, not only as an organization, but also with the promoters and the track operators and the owners and say, hey, listen, what, what do we got to do here? I watched that race at, at Indy, and it was boring. Boring, to say the least. Boring. It was, you know, the only time there was any action was on restarts. And after that, they just spread out, and they're going, and they're going. And, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't good racing. It's not, that's not what it was like. That's not what, what Big Bill France set out to make. He didn't want parades with no music. He wanted to see side-by-side -side action, pushing and shoving, bumping and banging, beating and grinding. That's what he wanted to see on the racetrack because that's what fans come to see. They, yes, yeah, some come to see the wrecks, and that's not part of the plan. But nobody wants to see, you know, these at the end of the race, pristine cars rolling down pit road into the garage area and into their haulers. They don't want to see that. They want to see the scraped paint. They want to see that. They want to see sparks as they're going down into the corners. But you know what? The, the product that's out there now, NASCAR created this product. And people aren't going to see it anymore. And, you know, it, it used to be just a couple of the tracks. Now you're seeing empty seats. And I'll tell you what, when I flipped that race, I said, oh, whoa, I forgot the race is on. I put it on, and I'm like, huh? It looked like a practice session. There was nobody in the seats. And, yeah, there were a bunch of people that crowded up to the top to get you know, some shade. But you know what they did? This is what some of these tracks did. And i got to blame some of these tracks as well. Some of these tracks, they were sold out. So, hey, you know what? Let's build more seats. And they're sold out. Let's build some more seats. And the mistake that Indy made, just like Pocono, if you're sitting in the front stretch, you can't see the back stretch because they put seats on the other side. In Pocono, I think they call them pace set of seats or along pit road. So, you know, you got a two and a half mile track, 
and every 45 to 50 seconds, a pack of car goes by. And it's like you're sitting there, and they're like, zoom, 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 zoom. Then you sit back, have a beer, you have a hot dog, sitting there, talk to your friend. Because you can't see what's going on because there's grandstands on the other side across the straightaway. And all of a sudden, you hear that, and they're coming, and you're, and you're watching again, oh, this is great, man. And you sit back, have another beer, you sit back, you know. It's, people don't want to see that. They don't want to see that. These big two and a half mile, two mile racetracks, they're the ones that are getting hurt the most other than Daytona because you know that's like the the the, the World Series of racing, the the, the the Super Bowl racing. It's you know the only sport that their biggest race of the year is the first one. The biggest event. So anyway. I don't know. We're gonna we we gotta see what's gonna happen there. We gotta see what's gonna happen. But anyway, we're gonna take a break and we come back. We'll have a report from Bethel Motor Speedway up in White Lake, New York, when we come back. InRavio.com wants you. InRavio provides the best in TV, film, post-production, and so much more. And we're growing. Right now, we're looking for a team of pros that can join us. So what are you waiting for? We need show hosts production crew, marketing gurus, sales experts, audio engineers, lighting, visual effects, and camera crews. We want you. Go to enradio.com backslash join the team. Hey, I'm, I'm Raul Panther. And I'm Commander B. Hawkins. And I'm Mark Well. We're uh, some of the proto men. If we see you without this bracelet, we get punch in the d But if you have this bracelet from enradio.com, you can win 100 bucks. Put one of these on, or else. For over 60 years, Hanson Carpet has put the customer first, providing only the finest quality products and service. And Hanson Carpet is so much more than just carpet. We also carry a wide selection of window blinds and shades, and our licensed and insured technicians can service any of your flooring or window covering needs. Browse our huge selection of laminate, carpet, linoleum, vinyl, and tile. Stop by our showroom today, or visit HansonCarpet.com. No matter what your project, Hanson Carpet has got you covered. Hey, this is Chris Lester Jake, and if InRavio.com spots you at an event wearing this bracelet, they will give you $100. Hey, welcome back. Oh, Bethel Motors, I'll tell you, we're, we're headed back up there August 6th. I believe that's the legend stock. And uh, I'll tell you what, it, it, there's, that's another place when... when when our crew, when our van pulls up with the car, we pull up, we get out, you know, we're welcome from, from the guy who collects the, the tickets at the gate to the guy who sells the beers to the drivers, the owners. And, and it's, it's, it's like going home. It's like going to your college reunion, you know. Everybody's there saying, hey, hey, hey welcome back. But anyway, um, Bethel sent the press release out. We're going to use it because <laughs> that's what they send it out for. But anyway, uh, uh, patience pays off as... The Gracia collects his first, first Bethel modified win. And I'll tell you what, we interviewed a guy who was his first win ever, and, and the guy was speechless. But anyway, uh, racing is really thought of a sport as a sport of patience, but patience can often pay off in a big way, both literally and figuratively. As it did for Joe De Gracia, capturing his first career Bethel modified uh, win this past Saturday at the Bethel Motor Speedway. Robbie Konikowski and Skip Lapote started on the front row for the start, while De Gracia sat sixth. Konikowski and Lapote swapped the lead in the opening laps where Konikowski was able to put the car solidly out in front prior to the halfway point of the race. Current point leader John Cote came to second just past the halfway point and began applying pressure to Konikowski for the top spot. By this time, Steve Galgano had worked his way to third and the top three ran in tight quarters and tight quarters on a tight racetrack is pretty tough. With five laps remaining in the event, Lapote pulled into the pits with a fuel leak and DeGracia inherited the fourth place spot as the top three continued to battle out up front. The field was given a two to go signal and the face of the race changed as Konikowski bobbled slightly. Coming off a of turn two, setting off a chain reaction that collected Coat and forced Galgano to restart at the rear of the field as well. Degrassi was catapulted into the lead for the restart and he was able to hold off the competition to take his first checkered in the division. Frank James crossed the line second and Galgano finished third. And I'll tell you what, that if you've never been to Bethel Motor Speedway, it's, it's 
It's, I'll tell you, it's like Martinsville shrunk down. It really is. It's an awesome place. Uh, yeah, the only full, in his only, his first full season on asphalt, Rick Mill had indeed proved himself to be a force to contend with, picking up his second consecutive win and seventh in the season in the 358 Sportsman class this past Saturday night. Kevin Crom started the race on the outside with Mike Dutka on the uh, inside, I'm sorry, on the inside with Mike Dutka on the outside. Dutka could essentially took command of the race with the drop of the green, and he held that spot for the first five laps of the event. On lap six, however, Mill, who had been sent to the rear for, in the opening laps for passing off the track surface, which is a no-no, uh, found himself in the front of the field, and he wrestled the lead from Dutka. One lap later, Paul Martin charged to second, and the current point leader, Kyle Redner, came to third one lap after that. Mill took advantage of the ensuing battle behind him for second between Martin and Redner as he began to distance himself from the field. Mill was first to the checker, followed by Martin and Redner. And patience again was the key in the legend feature as well as defending Young Lions champion Alan McCollin came out on top at the conclusion of the caution field event. After qualifying, Gillian Kilpatrick redrew the pole with Stephen Hershey to the outside. Kirkpatrick, the track's 2015 legend co-rookie of the year, put her car solidly out in front at the start of the race and was able to hold off the challenges of defending pro masses and semi-pro champion Joseph Graf until lap eight. When at that point Graf got by for the lead, Graf soon found himself in the, with his hands full as McCollum and 2014 Pro Masters champion Richie Coy were both involved in one of the late race cautions ending his night. McCollum grabbed the lead as a result and was able to hold off Coy and current Young Lions semi-pro point leader Drew Bowditch for the win for the second week in a row. And the fifth time this season, Steve Verriz found himself in victory lane at the conclusion of the Bandolero race. Verriz started on the outside of the front row alongside Eugene Storm. Drew, Drew got the early lead, but Verriz got by with just three laps in the books, bringing current point leader Tyler Dockenhausen with him to second. As the laps clicked off, Dockenhausen continually challenged Verriz for the lead, even getting alongside of him several times to no avail. Verriz kept his car out front, crossing the line ahead of Dockenhausen and Drew. Teddy Cranor led every lap at the beginning of Bondaleo feature to take down his seventh win of the season. Cranor started on the outside pole and took full advantage of the, when pole sitter Katie Verriz and Nick Acciari were involved in the first lap caution, handling Cranmer the lead. One south front, Cranmer never looked back as Ryan Bill held second before surrendering this opera to Verriz just prior to the halfway point. Cranmer was first across the line, followed by Verriz and Bill. Defending pro stock champion Kenny Atkins collected his sixth win of the season. Matt Crossan and Ed Butler started on the front row and swapped the lead between themselves over the first two laps before contact resulted in a caution and both cars were forced to restart at the rear of the field. This handed the lead to Atkins, who then had to contend with current point leader Jim Height in second and Vinny Stanton Jr. in third. The caution flew once again for Stanton Jr., bringing Butler back to third. Atkins maintained the lead following the final restart and crossed the line ahead of Helt and Butler. Four was the lucky number of the night for the street stock competitor Kyle Welsh, who came from the fourth starting spot and collected his fourth victory of the season. Rookie Patty Falcana and 2015 Rookie of the Year Wait Henry sat on the front row for the start, but Welsh wasted no time putting the car out front before the initial lap was complete. He then led every lap with two-time champion Amber Van Orden in tow for the majority of them. Defending champion Gary Van Orden made his way up to third and worked his way past the younger Van Orden with just three laps remaining. As the laps clicked off, without a caution, Van Orden was unable to mount a successful bid for the league and Welsh claimed the win over G. Van Orden and Ann Van, Van Orden. Brian Biofine took the lead in the four-cylinder advance race just before the halfway point and drove on to collect his fifth win of the season. Jerry Kingeter started the pole and led the first two laps before Tim Curry was able to grab it in for a single lap. King Gardner reclaimed the spot, but only temporarily as Biofine grabbed it on lap nine. Joe Morris came to second briefly, but Curry was not able to back down, and he took the spot back just leap three laps later. With five laps remaining in the event, defending champion Mike Travis worked his way back from an earlier pit stop to claim third. The top three remained unchanged over the closing laps, and Biofine grabbed the win over Curry and Travis. 
Just one week after picking up his first career win, Vinny DeGraw led every lap of the caution-free four-cylinder novice race to pick up his second win. Nick Curry started on a pole alongside Nicole Nelson. Neither had the chance to lead a lap as DeGraw came from his third place starting spot to grab the lead on the initial lap. Nelson ran in the second spot for nearly half of the event before being overtaken by Travis Coswell. Newcomer Eddie Jones took advantage of the opening and followed Coswell to claim third. The laps ticked off without any cautions to slow the pace and DeGraw crossed the line ahead of Cogswell and Jones Jr. Both of DeGraw's wins came in a car borrowed from current four-cylinder advance point leader Mike Travis. This coming Saturday, July 30th, the Street Stock Division will highlight the night taking part in time trial qualifying for the first time ever and competing in twin 25 lap features. Mondaleros will also have time trial qualifying. Joining them on the schedule will be the Bethel Modified, the BMS Modified, the 358 Sportsman, the Legends, the Pro Stocks, and the four-cylinder advanced novice classes. Grandstands admit just $8, $8, and children five and under admitted free of charge. For any more information regarding a including a complete 26 schedule, can be obtained online at www.bethelmotorspeedway.com or you can call their office at 845-319-7908, Tuesday through Friday from 9 to 6. We're going to show all the, the finishes here, I believe, at the Bethel Modified Series. Uh, modified finish, finish. Joe DeGrassi, as we said, was the winner, followed by Frank James, Steve Galgano, third, John Cote, fourth, Robbie Konikowski, fifth, Skip Laporte, um, sixth, and Rob Rafferty did not make it out in, for the start of the race. In the 358 Sportsman feature finish, which was 20 laps, Rick Mill was the winner there, followed by Paul Martin, Kyle Redden, the third, Mike Dutka, fourth, Rich Coons, fifth, Mike Trevor, sixth, Dan Dolan, seventh, and did not start, or DQ, uh, did not, Dan Colin did not start, and Kevin Chrome was disqualified. In the Legends feature, finished 20 laps for the Legends, Alex McCollum was first, followed by Richie Coy, Drew Bowditch, third, Chris Hammett, fourth, Joe Graff, fifth, Eugene Drew, seventh, Jesse Hilger, Jesse Hilgo was 7th, Mickey Policastro 8th, Jerry Machia 10th, 9th and 10th was Jeff LaCourte. And there were no DQs in that one. In the Bondolero feature finish, 15 lapper, Sean Verize was the winner, followed by Tyler Dockenhausen. 3rd was Eugene Storm Drew, 4th Mike Roth. Connor Pazaki was 5th, 6th was Jeff Dara, 7th Jade McElray, and 8th was Isabella Machia. In the beginning, Bonalero feature finish, 15 laps. Teddy Cranmo was first, followed by Katie Verize. Third was Ryan Brill, and Nick Archieri was fourth. The pro stocks went down like this. Kenny Atkins was the winner of that 20 lap feature, followed by Jim Height. Ed Butler was third, Mac Cross in fourth, Vinnie Stanton Jr. fifth, and Jim Sykes followed in the sixth position. The street stock feature, 20 laps. Kyle Welch first, Gary Van Orden second, Amber Van Orden, fourth. Joe Murns, fourth. Fifth was Joe Smith, sixth. Steve Smalley, seventh was Walt Henry. Eighth was Patty Falcana, ninth, Jessica Ritchie. Brian Chirico was tenth. And uh, John Hager was DQ'd. Hmm. Fourth cylinder advanced feature, finished 20 laps. Brian Biofine was the winner there, followed by Tim Curry. Third was Mike Travis, fourth, Joe Morris. Billy Porter was fifth, Cody. Hock Telling was sixth, Jerry Kingeter was seventh, and Wayne Atkins rounded out the, uh, the eighth place uh, finish there. The four-cylinder novice feature finish. Vinny DeGraw was the winner, followed by Travis Cogswell. Third was Eddie Jones, fourth, Kayla Curry, fifth, Gene Helms. John Huckling was sixth, Nicole Nelson, seventh, Richard Smith, the third, eighth. Dan Huckling was ninth, Felicia Reckenbaugh, tenth. So that's it from the Bethel Motor Speedway, one of our partnering partners here at the 505 On Racing Show. And, uh, you know, it's, I've got to point that out, you know. Um, we were talking about beers at, at, <laughs> at Indy, and uh, the 22 figure eight said if you had a beer every lap, it'd be 200 beers. I don't think I've had 200 beers all year. But anyway, because I'm not a beer drinker, but um, there is no beer at Bethel Motor Speedway. And no coolers are allowed in the pit area. And, you know, I, I'll tell you what, I was kind of surprised when, when I saw that. 
Because it used to be just no beer, and then people would sneak it in. So now to eliminate that, there's no beer. Yeah, anyway, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll wrap up the evening with the Xfinity Series from, from Indy and the Sprint Cup Series in Indy as well when we come back. Village Music Shop of Master. 1-800-HEY-DUDE, your full-service store with personalized attention, school band instrument rentals and sales, music instruction on all instruments for all styles and age groups, for guitars, drums, amplifiers, PA systems, and accessories. It's Village Music Shop, 1495 Montauk Highway in Mastic. Call 1-800-HEY-DUDE or go to villagemusicshop.com. What's up guys, we're Stan Fair, and we're here with Enravio. If they catch you at a show with one of these bracelets, you will win a hundred bucks. That's a lot of money. So get a bracelet. Do whatever it takes to get that. Hit them up online. <laughs> This is Chris Lewis Jake, and if Enravio.com spots you at an event wearing this bracelet, they will give you $100. The world of advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, Enravio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is Enravio.com. Welcome back. All right, Indy, the Xfinity Series was there. Uh, Kyle Busch was the winner from the poll, followed by Kevin Harvick. Paul Renard uh, was third, Carl Larson fourth, Justin Algaia fifth, followed by Elliot Sadler in sixth. Then we have Daniel Suarez in seventh, Joey Logano eighth, Ty Dillon ninth, and Brandon Jones rounding out the top ten. While we're talking about the Xfinity Series, Stuart Haas Reeson has announced that we'll field a full-time single-car team in the NASCAR Xfinity Series in 2017. At this moment, there is a driver or primary sponsor has, has been named to this team. However, the plan is to use the Xfinity Series car at Stuart Haas Reeson as an in-house driver development program. Think about that. Their own driver development program. Kind of similar to what Joe Gibbs has done. Kind of similar to what uh, Richard Childress has done. You know, you, you got to start them somewhere. And you know what? Why not start them in your own group? There's a little loyalty involved. Loyalty is big. And Tony Stewart's big on that. So it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. And who's going to end up with that ride? Will it be a truck series, you know, younger guy? Because I don't think they're going to go with an older guy. They're going to go to a young guy that they can mold their way. So I, I'll tell you what, you know, even though Tony Stewart will be retiring as a driver at the end of the season, I think his ownership status in Stewart Haas Racing is going to come to the forefront. He's going to do some things that are different, and it's going to be a good different, a good different. So I, I, I welcome that, Tony. That, that's a, an awesome, awesome uh, move on your part. Uh, okay, the Cup Series was there in Indy. Uh, Kyle Busch was the winner there from the pole, imagine that. And, and Kyle Busch is the first driver to sweep the pole and wins 
in both series and won the same weekend. Matt Kenseth was second, Jimmy Johnson third, Denny Hamlin was fourth, followed by Kyle Larson in fifth. Kevin Harvick was sixth, Joey Logano seventh, Martin Truex Jr. eighth, Austin Dillon ninth, Paul Menard tenth. Place was empty. The only action was on restarts. It took three times to get the race finished with green-white checkers. It was just, you know, you come down the straightaway at Indy right before the corner. It's, 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 it's wide. It's, you can go four or five wide, but, you know, you get to the corner, it's a bottleneck. Kind of like the Oakdale Merge, for those of us on Long Island who know about it, where ten lanes becomes six. But anyway, it's not a racetrack that the, that the car should be on. They've been racing there since 94. It's gotten worse and worse and worse every year since. You know, yeah, in the beginning, oh, it's great, we're at Indy, oh, they, 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 they was standing room only, turning people away. I, I'm, I'm thinking people were standing on the corner with stacks of tickets. Who needs tickets? Who needs them? I got them. You know, NASCAR and the owners, the track owners, need to sit down and figure out what are we doing wrong? We need to get the people back here. We need to get them back here. And you know who they should talk to? The people who are paying good money to go to these races. Talk to these people. Talk to people. Go back to your list and say, wait, this guy hasn't renewed his seats in a couple of years. Talk to that guy. Talk to that girl. Talk to that family. Find out why they're really not coming back. I wish somebody called me. I'd give them, I'll tell them. I'll tell them because, you know, as you know, I have a good way. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, pretty good at telling people things. Yeah, not. But anyway. <laughs> Another thing, Jeff Gordon drove the Hendrick Motorsports number 88 in Dale. Earnhardt Jr.'s absence, subbing for him. Um, you know, I'll tell you what, when, when, you know, Jeff Gordon is still involved, heavily involved with Hendrick Motorsports, even though he's in the announcer's booth. His office is in Hendrick Motorsports. So why not put him in? You know, and, and I've always said that, you know, with some of these guys, they never retire. You know, you look at guys like Morgan Shepard, he's 70 years old, still racing. Dave Marks, how old was he when he finally packed it in? You know, they're still going at it. They're it. And I'll tell you what, Jeff Gordon, you know, and I said this last year, you're going to see him in a car once in a while. Everyone's, nah, no, nah, he's done, he's done, he's got a bad back, he's got this, he's got to make him an announcer. No, he's, he's, this ain't going to be the last show for Jeff Gordon. And, you know, he wasn't, you know, and, I, and from what I watched at the race, he wasn't like when he was in the 24. But you know what? He was he was there, but in the you know top 15, 16 all day long, you know depending on when the restarts were. And, and I'll tell you what, you know, when you you have a driver of, of of Jeff Gordon's caliber, who could, yeah, he could drive every once in a while. And and I think if you listen to his retirement talk last year, you go back and you you, you could go and, and search for it. What he was retiring from at the time was the week-to-week -week and day-to-day -day running of a race car. His body can't take it anymore. He's got, he's got a, a few kids. He's on a second marriage. You know, it's time to settle back. He, he has everything he could ever ask for, you know, financially. The homes, the cars, the toys, the investments. He, he, he's a businessman, owns a team. He's a partner in the, in the Jimmy Johnson team. And, and, he, and he's got... He's got Xfinity cars. He's, he's, he invested well. He, he's a businessman. And, you know, he's not hurting for anything. He's, you know, he's, he's just not. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. And, and you look at these things and, you know, his, his own is part of the, the charter program. When you look, when, when, you know, and, and they built up to that. They, you know, two weeks ago, well, if Dale can't race, we're going to put Jeff Gordon in the car, you know. And if you don't think they spent a few days practicing somewhere, because, you know, I know it's like riding a bike and it only takes a couple of laps to get your rhythm back, but you know what? He wasn't in his car that he was in for how many years. You know, they don't build new frames unless they bend them up. They just put new bodies on them. And, and you know, when you look at some of these cars, and I remember reading the thing about, well, the name of the book was Cheaters, and I don't remember who wrote it, but the, the, the cars that the Sprint Cup Series is using now, the chassis are from 1965 technology. Now, somebody's going to tell me I'm wrong and I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, how many rear-wheel drive cars do you see on the highway today? Because there's no front-wheel drive cars in the Sprint Cup Series or the Xfinity. So how many, how many do you see, you know? How, how many do you see? How many two-door Camrys do you see on the highway? Zero. So the technology that they're using for the frames and, and the drivetrain is 
is old technology. Yeah, they went to fuel injection, all that kind of good stuff. But you know, when you, when you look back, you know, that that technology hasn't changed. I can remember sitting next on a modified on the rails on the side rails of a, of a modified with the former national champion Jerry Cook, NASCAR competition director, presently, and we talked about back in his day when they made everything to now, what's the difference? And he goes, the only difference is now that somebody was smart enough to mass produce our parts. Now you can call the parts, go, hey, I need this, and, and it's, you know, the UPS guy shows up and there it is. He says, other than that, the technology is exactly the same. Yeah, they've tweaked it a little bit, you know, they've made them, you know, put bars here and put bars there for, for safety reasons, you know, and, and, you know, fortunately somebody has to get hurt or lose their life for some of these, some of these things to be put into place, you know, the, the the Earnhardt bar was put in in the middle of the windshield so things didn't go through there. You had, you know, the, 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 the John Blewett, the third, you know, it, it went, went on with him and it, another bar was there. Every time there's an incident, there's another bar added, you know. And uh, and even with the, with the angles, and, I, and, and when a modified, and I could say this because I was involved with it, when a modified crashes, now let's go back, preseason, before the first race, Every car is measured. There's, there's pages of measurements you have to take on the car. When that car is involved in a wreck, those measurements are taken again, and they look and see what moved. Is this off? Is that off? And most of those measurements are made in the cockpit. And I'll tell you what, you know, as, as strong as these things are, sometimes you need that little give because that was what that's what possibly killed some of the guys in the old days. The cars are too rigid. So the most loosest thing in the car was the driver's body. So you need things to break and bend and push and shove and go here and absorb the impact. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, what, that has made modified racing in the United States safe today. You know, and, and I, I, I wasn't really a modified fan growing up. Um, I was too busy with figure eight cars at ISO Speedway in the 70s and, and 80s, and I really didn't pay attention to modifieds until I was an official. And, you know, because I, I had to watch the modified race, and I think when I was a kid, it was just too loud. It was just too loud. Maybe that's why I don't have any hearing. But, but anyway, it was, it was fun, and it was good, and, and, and they're going to continue to change the cars and make them safer, and, and they spend a lot of time doing that, the NASCAR engineers. I just wish the NASCAR marketing people would spend just as much time to put a good product on the racetrack in the top series and sit down, like I said earlier, with the track operators, the owners, the teams. What can we do to make the racing exciting again, exciting enough that the people are going to come out to it? The old Southern 500 used to be run on Labor Day weekend, and it used to be hot as the Dickens, and the place was packed. Didn't matter how hot it was, they, they showed up. See, now people aren't doing that. And, and, the, and the, the cameras are very careful not to show all the empty seats. And I'm sure somebody in the control room said, hey, show a different angle, we don't want to see all those empty seats. Just saying. But anyway, the, uh, we got the Cup Series, the next event will be Pocono, unless NASCAR cancels because of the heat. And the Xfinity Series, they will be in Iowa. So. The, so the Cup and the Trucks will be at uh, Pocono. The Infinities will be at Iowa. And the, the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour, their next event is in Stack. A couple of weeks. And that's, a, that's about it. That's what's coming up. We'll be at Bethel Motor Speedway in two weeks for Legend Stock. Looking forward to that. And uh, I hope everybody's doing well. Whatever your endeavors are going to bring you through this weekend, please be safe. Please be careful. Give somebody a hug. Tell them you love them. God bless you all. And we'll see you next Monday. Thanks a lot, everybody. Good night.